Kelly J, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So just as we were about to speak, I was surfing the net, as, as I often do, and uh, here I'm looking at an article fairly recently published on uh, RNZ, it's a Radio New Zealand. It's like, <laughs> mm. Okay, so you know where I'm going with this maybe, but <laughs> so the headline was, police urge anyone, including the rainbow community, to report threats, violence. And I saw this, I was like, okay, these people are taking seriously, you know, the violence that was inflicted against you. But <laughs> then I read the article, and no, 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 they're talking about, like, the violence that is appearing in tweets and online, and uh, these threats that are supposed to have been launched at at trans people, supposedly because of you. Yeah, well, even silence is violence, isn't it, in 2023? It's not just words. I mean, I I just think anybody, I think Chris Rock says it better than me, anybody that's actually had a punch in the face understands that words are not really violence. Um, but we've gone from words of violence uh, to now silence is violence. Um, and once you start throwing about this word violence, meaning something other than physical harm, then we really are in the territory that if I say something somebody doesn't like, they can call it violence, then they can respond with actual violence. So uh, the interesting thing, however, about that story is uh, there is no record of the police saying any such thing at all. Uh, so I think one of the more independent news sources in New Zealand tried to find this um, the, this sort of police announcement and they they couldn't find it. So it's even more sinister because RNZ is the state-sponsored media and it just seems that we are in make-up lies territory. Because there have been so many security concerns around your appearances, uh, the police are accused by one side or the other of being biased. In your experience, because unfortunately, you know, <laughs> you're kind of the world expert on this now, uh, are, are police generally fair in policing mobs that try to show up and shut down speakers like you? Absolutely not. No, they're not. And I don't think it's individual officers because I think the run-of-the-mill mid-30s officer who wasn't polluted with this nonsensical ideology in their schooling, I think they, in the main, joined the police force. It's not like a well-paid job. They joined the police force to uphold the law. I don't think they joined the police force to enable young men to scream in the faces of middle-aged women, sometimes the sort of women that are the same age as their own mothers. Um, and I don't, obviously it's not just men that join the police force, it's women, but they have a very different role to play in this particular ideology. But if we just stick to men, um, no, I don't think they did. But high, higher up the food chain, there is something really rotten um, and politicised and ideologically captured in many police forces. Uh, whether it's Canada, um, the UK, uh, Scotland is particularly dreadful, um, Wales, Ireland, um, and obviously New Zealand and Australia. There was uh, a guy um, out in British Columbia, um, which politically is maybe our Scotland on this issue, but he was, you know, he's he's kind of maybe a little bit like you, sort of a very much uh, sort of in your face uh, presence and and very much stands up to what he calls gender ideology. Uh, I guess what I call gender ideology too. And there's this footage from a few weeks ago where he was physically assaulted when he was doing one of his protests, and you saw a police officer smirking as this was happening. And this whole thing, as you can imagine, on social media became a big thing, where. Unfortunately, the police officer was called out by name, and the whole thing became very personal. But I did want to follow up just in general on the constabulary in the United Kingdom. I don't know if it's still the case, but for years, it seems like people have been tweeting these images of police in, I don't know, like Kent or Yorkshire, kind of like standing awkwardly with drag queens with like a banner that says something like police united with LGBT and there's like a painted sidewalk. And of course, the comments under these <laughs> tweets are always like, you know, shouldn't you be solving crimes instead of doing photo ops with drag queens? Are police forces in the UK, have they been recruiting from like gender studies programs or something like that? 
no idea about the recruitment. What I do know is that in the last uh, five years, I've been interviewed three times by the British police under caution, which means uh, I have the right to remain silent. It's a voluntary interview. If I don't attend the interview, um, then they can come and arrest me. So it doesn't feel too voluntary. Uh, but I've interviewed. I've been interviewed three times uh, for tweets or words that I've said where I basically don't agree with this ideology. I've had the police visit my home um, because they said I was being untoward about paedophiles. Um, and then I've also been arrested during lockdown because I made the mistake of thinking that political protest or political meetings were allowed in the street during lockdown, but actually it was only, uh, you could only be protected from COVID if you were actually protesting against racial equality in the United States in England. We had those studies in North America which demonstrated conclusively that COVID will not spread if you are at a Black Lives Matter protest. Uh, and you're also not violent. So there's you don't cause any criminal damage. You're not violent. It's a magic peaceful. thing. Mostly, mostly. peaceful. Well, mostly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so um, I, well, I want to ask you a little bit more on the, the police thing because so in New Zealand one of the worst things that happened to you is there, apparently this is a notorious activist, well, depends, I guess, on, on your perspective, whether they're notorious or not, but a well-known activist in the gender field, I, I can't even guess what pronouns are in use here, poured red fluid all over you. Uh, yes. It's kind of a form of assault, some would argue. Um, and, and the police, I guess, to their credit, apparently were looking for this person because it was captured on film. Uh, but then this person posted a selfie on Twitter saying, oh, uh, things aren't safe for me in New Zealand, so here I am on a plane. I, th I don't know, they were headed to Los Angeles or something. What, what became of that? So I would, I would say he um, has been charged, and uh, I believe he has to attend the court in July. So he has been charged with assault. Um, I think he also said something odd about what he was carrying in Australia. I won't go into any more than that because I don't want to sort of make myself vulnerable to libel. But uh, I think there were other reasons that, that he was going to be um, returned to New Zealand from some Australia. Kind of United Nations uh, accredited activist or something. There was something like a, yeah, U yeah. a UN, UN women. U oh, UN well, well, women. Naturally. Yeah. So. UN women is, po is heavily populated by uh, men. Uh, heavily popular. They don't call themselves men, uh, but I would. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 police were looking for him. I think he was charged, um, and it was very unusual because normally I would have to um, actually formally complain, make a complaint in order for him to get charged. But the police had made an exception. This is, as I understand it, I'm not a, an expert in New Zealand law, but. Um, yeah, they made an exception in order to charge him. But that was, I mean, that wasn't the worst of what happened to me that day. Like having something pulled over me in order to intimidate me and um, ridicule me and cause me distress and upset and therefore to stop me talking or to make me look stupid. Uh, that wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing was I was kicked. I was, I was like grabbed as I was both going into the middle where I had no idea there were no police in the middle of that crowd. I thought there were police i thought we were just getting through the crowd to the safe area uh, so i had no idea that there were no police right in the center of that um and then obviously on my way out um the screams the taunts the kicks the pulls uh the being pushed over um there was a woman next to me a lesbian called tanya and uh i remember seeing a guy just a regular really regular looking man in den in denim um and i thought when i was sort of in the middle of it that he was trying to help because he was sort of grabbing her. And when I now look at the footage, he's trying to push that woman to the floor. He's, he's like an intersectional feminist. Excuse me. That guy's an intersectional <laughs> feminist. And uh, <laughs> he's he's a hero. Kelly J, have some respect. Uh, yeah, sorry. I apologize. Yeah. And so the other thing that I have to take you to task for, Kelly J, is uh, uh, you do feminism wrong. I'm here to tell you that. Um, I don't do feminism at all. I'm, I'm well, really... okay. So that's, I was back in, in into this, but so we have this uh, wonderful columnist to Quillette. Uh, her name is Holly Lawford Smith. Lawford yep. Smith. Holly Lawford Smith. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, she sat down with you and talked. And one of the things that was really disappointing, I learned that, to my knowledge, you don't call yourself a feminist, which actually hurts me as a man because I've been going around telling everybody, hey, it turns out I'm this great feminist because I'm uh, an ally, I think that's the right word, to all these women who are protecting sex-based rights so where's my parade? I'm this this wonderful male feminist. And now and then I read this and I don't even get to call myself a feminist. This is this is really disappointing. Uh Kelly J, can you can you talk a little bit about why you don't use the F word to describe yourself? Well, there's plenty of F words that I do use. <laughs> um It look, I I started on this whole thing in 2015. I found out what was going on by 2018. I was sort of putting money together to put up this billboard and selling T-shirts and so on. And there were a lot of women on the left who are more loyal to men on the left than they are to this cause, even though they promote themselves as as sort of leaders in this cause. Um, And I just constantly, oh, you're not a feminist because you don't do this, or you're not a feminist because you don't do that, or you talk to that person, that's not what a feminist would do. And I just thought, all right, shove your labels. I'm not a feminist then. If you're going to try and police my behavior or my views or what I say or guilt by association, or all these things that I think belong back in school. And I'm just I'm not going to I'm not going to be governed by this sort of childish behavior. I won't call myself a feminist. Um, and before that, I'd had issues with um, I understand why they did it, but I do have fundamental issues with the way w- women are viewed who become mothers uh, by feminists or women that are in heterosexual relationships. Uh, And it's not every feminist that does this, but it was enough that I just thought, look, I get it. In order to make women uh, sort of fully-fledged operators in the world, we had to kind of tell them that they could rid themselves of the shackles of motherhood. But the truth is four-fifths of the world's women actually do become mothers, and most of that 80% actually do really, really enjoy it. And and I'm I just can't belong to something that a movement at all that tries to diminish and belittle it. What they should have done is they should have injected value into it and they should have found a way of making motherhood a really valuable thing, as opposed to don't do it, don't be tied down, don't be shackled. This is an expectation. And it's not. I think it's a biological imperative to become a parent. The traditional way of breaking ranks with with feminism is to like invent a new wave of feminism. And I Again, I, I'm, I'm new to feminism, as I've mentioned, so I don't even know how many waves we're up to. But didn't, did it occur to you that you just create like a new, you'd be like an eighth wave feminist? Is it because you're not in the academy that it didn't occur to you to create a more obscure form of feminism? <laughs> I wanted to be appealing to most women. And I think once you say, right, I'm this sort of person, this is my, this is my ideology, it belongs in this word with this definition... You instantly just, you know, I want conservative women in America um, and in this country and uh, political women or of all shades or none. I want them to all feel that this is something that they can belong to without having any qualifiers or any sort of checklist of what their opinions are. Because you just need to know that women don't have penises and that you don't want men in our space, which is the majority of women on the, the planet, to feel that this movement is for you, that what I do is speaking to you, not for you. Yeah, but then you're going to attract women who don't even have gender studies degrees. I mean, look, I talk about those women. I do talk about the women. Uh, not Look, we know that some women got kicked out of academia. And we know that some women stayed in when women's studies changed to gender studies. And we know the women that stayed in allowed it because they didn't leave it. And I'm not saying that that they could have been powerful or whatever, but we know that we know that many women in academia ushered this in, along with a certain type of men, a man who also works in academia, who was quite happy for women to start being sort of squeezed. So I do, I you know, I I have a little bit of a hard time with people taking big fat salaries whilst selling women down the river. Britain has become a kind of weird place on this issue because on the one hand, because the radicalization of the gender movement maybe began or at least seemed to take root fairly early in the UK, the backlash also started earlier. So now you have 
very promising legislative developments. You have a government that seems to want to impose common sense a little bit, at least on this issue, in the political realm. But then you have this really crazy academic and media environment. I'm thinking, is it called Pink News? Is that the name of the outlet? Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but, and so this Pink News kind of markets itself as a mainstream, mainstream LGBT outlet. But every time I go there, especially coverage of you, it's mm. like this crazy cult site that, mm. like, like, do they have, like, did you do something to the editors there or something? Like, what's, what's, their, what's their issue? I don't know. I think it's... Who runs that I place? Think, uh, well, th- I think they make a, a pretty nice bit of cash. I've heard people call it penis news, which seems quite obscene. Yes. Is it run by a bunch Actually, of dudes? It's run by a couple of men, I think. Uh, I think they both come from affluent families. I think they probably had a nice tidy little sum to start it. Um, and maybe it started as a good thing. You know, they're gay men. Maybe it started as something um, not quite so vile towards women, but uh, that's where the money is. There are certainly some gay men in the UK who are fighting the good fight. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Simon Edge is, is, is one of my favorite writers. Uh, so, I mean, this is kind of a civil war within what traditionally has been called the LGBT community. I mean, I guess you're a bystander to this, but are you getting dragged in? Uh, probably not, because I think the I'm I'm so busy with what these men pose to, uh, what sort of threat these men pose to women. But I I think look, the T was an, I think the T did used to belong to the LGB. I think it was a natural thing. It was a you know, transsexuals uh, were often uh, gay men, and that's so by the I way, just to be clear, that's that's how they once referred to themselves, and and still there are a minority of trans people who still use the term transsexuals. Yeah, and you've you know, so we knew that we knew it was quite effeminate gay men. So Marsha P. Johnson, for example, he calls himself a gay man uh, dressed as drag. Uh, that's how he refers to himself. There's video footage saying this. Uh, there's you know, he didn't call himself a trans woman or transgender at all. He's just been co-opted like so many other people um, in our history. Uh, you're, you're referring to the, the, re- the rewriting of history where yeah. where everything is turned into uh, sort of post-facto trans. Yes. Okay. Um, um, Marsha, so, you know, that it sort of seemed like it was a natural place because they were outsiders on the basis that uh, the bulk of society didn't want to know anything about homosexuality or men that were really effeminate or anything. So you could understand that they were natural allies. But now T often is just straight men who get sexually aroused wearing women's clothes. And they are the people pushing the hardest to be allowed into women's spaces. I think gender is a nonsensical, silly idea of separating one's body from one's brain uh, and I just don't, I just, don't, I think it's a, it's a fool's errand. I think it's a swift road to hell to try and pretend that we have some ethereal, I mean, I'm not religious. I don't believe in souls. And I think gender is probably a secular notion of, of a soul. Uh, well said. Uh, can we talk about Scotland? Because mm-hmm. as radicalized as things have gotten in the UK in general, uh, Scotland seems things just there got even more bizarre. So Nicola Sturgeon had to resign in part, I think, because she took such an unsustainably hard progressive line on the gender issue. Yeah. Um, And then when I was reading the news about her resignation, I was just shocked at some of the positions she had taken, including at least at one point, really a kind of completely permissive attitude toward letting any male-bodied individual who had committed a crime, often, unfortunately, horrible sex crimes, enter female prisons. And it was only under (laughs) mortifying and sustained pressure that Sturgeon actually walked walked that back, and even then, in like a very incoherent and unconvincing way, and this was shortly before she was forced to resign. Uh, Do you have an explanation for how Scotland went so loony on this issue? Once you've taken a position that you believe in a quasi-religious cult, uh, you can't question any of it. If she'd said at any one point, no, that person, that that man is a man, that rapist is a man, belongs in the male estate, 
you then have to say, well, what about the CEO of the Rape Crisis Center who calls himself a woman, who's not legally recognized, uh, doesn't have a gender recognition certificate, um, is legally recognized as a man who's running rape crisis, who's saying that trauma needs to be reframed to not be transphobic. When a rape victim comes to um, the, the women's aid that he runs, uh, you have to you have to unravel all of it. I mean, that's I think it's that's what's wrong with all of this is you can't question any of it because it's so fragile. It will just all fall apart. So I, this may seem like a high, high flown analogy, but uh, I, I love uh, history podcasts, and, and I'm I'm waist deep right now in one called it's it's called History of England, but it involves a lot of of Scotland and and Wales and Ireland, uh, and. The discussion now is about the religious conflicts of the uh, Tudor era and the Stuart era. And it's it just reminds me so much of what's going on now, because what they were arguing about was so abstract and ethereal. It wasn't like arguing, well, what should the tax rate be? Should it be 6%, 8%? Like, you could compromise at 7% notions of of what god is and and jesus's relationship with god and the correct way to pray these are all seen as issues that if you if your soul has the correct alignment if you're sufficiently enlightened if you're alive to the word of god you just know these things and somebody who doesn't know these things is they're just they're ignorant or they're hateful or they're both and it struck me as very similar. It's as, I think the word you used was ethereal. Because it is so ethereal, you can say to a person, if you don't believe in this ethereal truth, you're just existentially on another moral level for me. Um, is that what you confront? Because you've literally looked into the eyes of a lot of these people who come at you during these mob scenes. And some of them seem like zealots, like, religious zealots um and there's almost a kind of speaking in tongues quality to some of the like this language they use about discovering their inner gender persona uh sometimes you look on twitter like you can't even understand what they're talking about they've invented like a whole language to explain their gender mm. fluidity and such uh is, is 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 that something you is it an ersatz religious war that we're we're looking at now yeah it's just a full-on cult um when i when I went to uh, the rally in, in New Zealand, when I went into, into the whole thing and I'm in the car and I, I just sort of say I, I've never felt so unsafe, but I was just thinking in those moments, like how do you rationalize or how do you reason with someone who's so irrational? Because that's what we're dealing with. And it must be terrifying. Like, I don't know how you maintain your, your composure in that situation. I would, I'd be freaking out. I was just really worried about the people around me falling over. So I think you sort of focus on the small things that you can control. I mean, it was, it was a really touch and go situation in Auckland, no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a, there was a point at which not v very long after into the, I'd been walking into the mob, did we start going over? And as opposed to being sort of 90 degrees to the ground, I was 45 degrees and I was moving over. And fortunately, uh, I don't know how it happened. I think I must have got pushed back up. But I was up again, and I, I really did think if I if I get to the floor, I'm I'm never getting out. I have a question for you about your relationship with other people in this movement, and and this is something that Holly got at in her piece for Quillette, which is that there are people I know we've discussed. You don't call yourself a feminist, but people in the feminist movement, and even people in the so-called gender critical movement, um, this is people who believe in biological sex differences, sometimes they're slurred as so-called TERFs, they, they've had their differences with you and have sometimes denounced your maybe more brash tactics. Um, in the aftermath of what happened in New Zealand, have some of them maybe reached out to you and said, hey, look, I know we've had our differences, but like that's just not cool what happened in New Zealand? And No. Yeah. Most of the people that, that I've had an issue with over the time, in fact... A couple of them even were like wrote blogs that I mean it's fair to say nobody reads, but they they wrote blogs in the aftermath saying, Oh, it's totally predictable. She kind of, you know, she deserved it. You know, that famous feminist. What was kind she of wearing? Trope of <laughs> pretty pretty much. Yeah. yeah like yeah. uh, but the truth of it is, what's been happening over the years, if 
these women have given credibility to the final sort of nails in the Nazi shaped coffin that I found myself in in the middle of Auckland, which was, you know, TRAs call people far right and Nazis all the time. But if people on your own side are going, well, she did once talk to someone who talks to someone who sat down on a chair next to Hitler one day back in the 1930s. You know, it's that sort of preposterous guilt by association, but about seven, seven places removed. And then it gives credibility to the more outlandish, crazy uh, but, okay, accusations. right. Although in this case, what happened in New Zealand is is worse because you actually had real right wing nutbags who crashed your. At least, I think at least one event in New Zealand and gave everyone an excuse to take pictures. It's like, oh look, you know, here you have uh, fascists showing up at a gender crit event. That must mean the gender crits are secret Nazis or whatnot. Like when you mm-hmm. saw those people show up where you're like, oh great, now I have to deal with this. We didn't see these people show up. So it's in Melbourne. That's where they showed oh, up. Sorry. So this was Australia. Um, this is in Australia. Australians and New Zealand people are different. I know this from flight of the Concords. Sorry about that. I apologize. <laughs> Please proceed. So we were in Melbourne, which is a relatively woke city. And all we can say, so we're just before we go out, we're in Parliament, and just before we go out, the security say uh, there's some people all dressed in black with masks on, and we're thinking Antifa. Yeah, sure. And and until the, the, the good guys, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the non-fascistic. That's right. For uh, fascist. Peace-loving <laughs> um, Antifa. So we don't know that there's anything else going on at all from our perspective where we're speaking until they walk parallel to us like on the opposite side and walk peacefully march by the police in single file and give a nazi salute if i had to put money on it if i had to put money on the fact that they were actual nazis i think i'd stretch to about 50p you know i think i'd like half a dollar it, i i wouldn't put any money on the fact that these are genuine uh people that believe in uh nazism i mean sad and pathetic as they would be Regardless, so you're saying I just find the whole it's yeah. too convenient. It's too yeah. convenient. So wait, I mean, so just, I mean, just to be clear, what you're saying, you think it might have been this is a bunch of basically Antifa types who are like, hey, I know how to take down these turfs. We'll do a little cosplay Nazi routine. I mean, because look, that, that does no, sound like people are going to accuse you of spreading a conspiracy theory. It just there was something. Look, there was something about it. Were they Antifa dressed up as Nazis? I don't know. Uh, was it because Moira, Moira Deeming, um, in her maiden speech, had talked about child safeguarding and um, women's right to privacy, dignity, and our own rights? Uh, would that be a great way to totally uh, finish her political career? Tell us, tell, tell, uh, us who, tell us who Moira is. Moira Deeming is the MP that spoke with us. She's an MP in Australian um, MP, yeah. Yeah. You talked about guilt by association. It was like her association with you who had spoken at this event where these cosplay Nazis showed up. And and so she was smeared as being Nazi yeah. ad- adjacent adjacent. Yeah. Let me just hang on. I just need to make it really, really clear because I think this is a very important point. They did not turn up at my rally. They did not turn up at my rally. They didn't stand with us. They had booked their own event as I understand it, or also on the steps, which is um, just weird in itself that they were allowed that amongst, like we had a women's rights meeting, there were some freedom people that had booked a meeting, and then there were uh, so-called Nazis or whoever. They did not at any point turn up at my rally. They were having one of their own, just happened to be down, the, down the, the, on the same steps, but much further down. And then there was another group of kind of anti-fascist um, fascists. And then there were another group of TRAs. So there were, uh, I think there were six different groups of people on that day. So it keeps being said that they turn up. To, they turned up at my rally. They didn't at all. They just happened to have one on the same day. Um, what happened to Moira is she got nine months suspension. She got publicly shamed. Suspended um, from which? Suspended from her party? Uh, from the Liberal Party, which is okay. like a conservative party. Um, I was also defamed where one of the MPs basically, uh, or the leader of the Liberal Party, read a Wikipedia page, which was written by a TRA, a trans rights activist about me, and read it all, (laughs) and read it all, 
and spewed it on the news as if it was true. Like, Wait, without so, saying so, to one of his aides, could you just check? Before I say this woman's friends with David Duke, can we just check? So you were libeled on Wikipedia. And, and as we all know, people can write any crap they want on Wikipedia. Yeah. Although, to, to be fair, some Wikipedia pages are well-maintained. But once you get into this kind of area, like, no intelligent person actually trusts that everything they read on Wikipedia <laughs> is is, yeah. is true because there's so-called, you know, edit wars where... People are not if you're a serious man, right? If you're a serious politician and you've got a public stage and you're just about to say the most heinous things about somebody, you think you just you just check. Just one just a couple of the facts you might check before you actually say this uh out loud out loud, even in a small room, let alone to the press. Uh if people want to find out more about what you're doing, where you're appearing. Who's libeling you on any given day? Uh, what's the what's the best web address they can go to as a one stop shop? I would probably go to uh, my Twitter account, which is at the Posy Parker. The Posy Parker. Thank you so much for being on the Quillette Podcast, and hope to talk to you again. Thanks so much.